Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So as we all know, SpaceX's Starship launched for the fourth time this past Wednesday, June 6th, 2024 at 7.50 a.m. Central Time. And also, as you guys know, I really, really wanted to stream it, especially on the heels of Boeing Starliner finally taking off just the day before. But as I eventually figured out, 7.50 a.m. Central is 5.50 a.m. Pacific, the time zone that I am currently living in, and that is just so, so early, you guys. And I had started my Starliner stream at 7.30 a.m. just the day before, so I just, I just couldn't do it. And as I said in my community post, I think the launch window started at 5 a.m. my time, so I set my alarm for six just to see. So I woke up kind of blearily, looked at my phone, saw that Starship had not exploded, and went, yay, and then immediately went back to bed. But then a couple hours later, I woke up well rested and saw what everyone else saw, which was success. Turns out fourth time is a charm. So let's get into what worked, why it worked and why it's such a big deal. So for the fourth time in about a year, SpaceX launched a test mission of its massive Starship rocket from Starbase, its development facility in Boca Chica, Texas. Just like the previous three launches, Flight 4 did not include a payload or astronauts and flew a suborbital trajectory. But unlike the previous launches, Flight 4 saw a soft splashdown of the Super Heavy booster and of the Starship upper stage. No RUDs this time, baby. As I said, liftoff took place at about 7.50 a.m. Central Time. 10, 9, 8, Vehicle is pitching downrange. Now on this fourth launch, there were two main goals. Number one, bring Starship's first stage booster, known as Super Heavy, down for a soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. And number two, achieve a controlled re-entry of the 165 foot tall upper stage known as Starship, or simply ship, but I prefer Starship. And neither of these goals had been met before. During Flight 3, the upper stage began to roll uncontrollably, preventing the vehicle from performing a relight of one of its six Raptor engines. But thanks to the Starlink satellite network, the rocket was able to stream back this partial re-entry through a gorgeous blanket of plasma, all of which I did cover in a previous video, which I will link below. At the time, SpaceX said, the lack of attitude control resulted in an off nominal entry with the ship seen much larger than anticipated heating on both protected and unprotected areas. The most likely root cause of the unplanned roll was determined to be clogging of the valves responsible for roll control. SpaceX has since added a additional roll control thrusters on upcoming starships to improve attitude control redundancy and upgraded hardware for improved resilience to blockage. And also during Flight 3, the Super Heavy booster prematurely shut down six out of the 13 Raptor engines used during the boost back burn, and they remained offline when it attempted to do a landing burn. In regards to this issue at the time, SpaceX said, the booster had lower than expected landing burn thrust when contact was lost at approximately 462 meters in altitude over the Gulf of Mexico and just under seven minutes into the mission. The most likely root cause for the early boost back burn shutdown was determined to be continued filter blockage where liquid oxygen is supplied to the engines, leading to a loss of inlet pressure in engine oxygen turbo pumps. And so for flight four, the plan was for the super heavy boosters to get additional hardware inside the oxygen tanks to further improve propellant filtration capabilities. And Elon Musk stated for Flight 4, the main goal of this mission is to get much deeper into the atmosphere during re-entry, ideally through max heating. And max heating is really just code for brutally hot re-entry. And when Flight 4 launched, not everything went 
100% super smoothly. The super heavy booster appeared to fire only 32 out of its 33 Raptor engines with one engine clearly out. Coming up shortly is gonna be Turned max Q, that maximum aerodynamic pressure as we go uphill on the vehicle. And when the Super Heavy fired up its 13 engine landing burn, last time six engines fired, this time 12 engines fired. And the Starship vehicle, meanwhile, clearly had burn through damage to one of its flaps during descent. And I'm sure you guys saw this, they had these insane live camera views of the flaps heat shield just burning, roasting away, and just debris covering the camera. The footage is pretty wild, and honestly, it's the only thing that makes me sad about not having seen this thing live. This camera view is looking right at one of the, the forward flaps. And we're, we're strategically putting some cameras around the vehicle to just look at the, the different areas. Looks like we got the flap starting to come apart a little. Yeah, it does appear that we have a little bit of burn through there. We can see pieces of the vehicle flying off. What a show it has been. It's been like watching Interstellar or something. <laughs> This is wild to see this, but the ship is still coming down, which is incredible to see. <laughs> How far can it go? That is the question. Keep your eye on the altitude in the bottom right-hand corner. We're at 54 kilometers right now. Now, ultimately, the data is the payload today. We've been saying it multiple times. We're the, you know, our teams are, are sitting, uh, reviewing this data live, learning where the hot spots are. As you can see, there's an obvious <laughs> hot spot there with the flap. But the camera came back despite losing signal several times, proving that Starship was still alive, which felt different than the other launches because I feel like with the other launches, every time we lost signal, that was pretty much the end of Starship. But the booster made its soft landing splashdown and Starship achieved a controlled re-entry and splashed down in the Indian Ocean. And this Flight 4 mission is a big deal, not only for SpaceX, who were clearly over the moon by all the hooting and hollering we heard, but also for NASA. Remember, Starship is supposed to be our ride to the moon when the agency embarks on its Artemis III mission, the one with the actual astronauts that will actually land on the moon and is due to embark in September 2026. But of course, Starship was also designed to be our ride to Mars. Its next-gen Raptor engines, 33 for Super Heavy and six for Starship, burn liquid oxygen and liquid methane, both of which can be sourced on Mars. So obviously at some point, the goal is to have a human rated version of Starship. So this flight is clearly a very good step in that direction. Lisa Watson Morgan, the manager of the Human Landing System Program, said they have been getting input from the astronaut office at Johnson Space Center as they're developing the human rated version of Starship. Watson Morgan said that the office offers insight and opinions on the functionality of certain parts of the vehicle, like interface and control systems and literally the location of handles, which makes sense. She said the HLS office mainly works with astronauts Raja Chari and Randy Bresnik. And in fact, this past April at SpaceX's headquarters, two astronauts performed the first integrated test with the pressurized spacesuits with a mock-up of Starship's elevator and airlock. Logan Kennedy, lead for the surface activities of NASA's HLS program, said in a statement, Overall, I was pleased with the astronauts' operation of the control panel and with their ability to perform the difficult tasks that they will have to do before stepping onto the moon. The test also confirmed that the amount of space available in the airlock, on the deck and in the elevator, are sufficient for the work our astronauts plan to do. So the human element is definitely something that they are currently working on when it comes to Starship. It's not just all launches and explosions, people. I think I mentioned this in my last Starship video, but their goal when it comes to launching Starship is to launch on a monthly cadence, which on the face of it sounds insane. But when you look at the dates in between the launches, 
they are definitely getting significantly shorter and shorter. Flight two comes 212 days after flight one. Flight three comes 117 days after flight two. And flight four comes 84 days after flight three. Watson Morgan said, even if it's every two to three months, that's still quite an achievement for a test campaign. And each one of these tests will buy down different risks. Now with the success of flight four, Musk seems to be looking towards achieving another milestone for Flight 5, catching the super heavy booster using the launch tower's so-called chopsticks. If you guys haven't heard of the chopsticks, <laughs> Here's the scoop. The chopsticks are arms attached to Mechazilla, the launch tower at Starbase. Mechazilla, I feel like sometimes Musk is just in this thing for the names. Mechazilla lifts and lowers super heavy boosters and Starship spacecraft onto Starbase's orbital launch mount using the chopsticks. Mechazilla is envisioned to be a multi-purpose structure, hosting Starship's touchdowns as well as liftoffs. Ideally, the giant tower will eventually catch returning super heavy vehicles using the chopsticks to support the boosters beneath their steering grid fins. Mechazilla will then place super heavy directly on the orbital launch mount, potentially enabling super fast turnaround times. So when it comes to flight five, for now, this seems to be one of the new goals. Starship will need to ace many more test flights before it's ready for its moon mission, but it seems off to a pretty decent start. It has made significant progress in each of its four liftoffs to date. And considering these super fast turnaround times, I'm sure a launch five is gonna be here before we know it. And I wanna cover it live. I do so much, but can it just not be at 5 a.m.? Maybe, possibly. <sighs> So let me know what you guys think. Were you impressed? Did you think number four would be the one? For me, it just feels like maybe these launches are a bit more fun to watch live right now because they are uncrewed. So when you have this insane, a flap is on fire before our eyes footage, it's just like, wee! yay. Now these kind of camera angles on Starship when there are astronauts aboard, totally different ball game. So yeah, let's just enjoy this time, everyone. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to all of you who were able to stop by my Starliner Live. Both of them. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video. Vehicle is pitching downrange.